Happy Sunday. That seemed loud or just me? Because I know I'm loud anyway. But happy Sunday. Uh, this is the first Sunday of Lent. And uh, we opened our Lenten season with our service last Wednesday night. And this indeed is the most holy time of the Christian calendar. So uh, as we approach Easter, may we all be uh, in that sense of seeking spiritual growth and spiritual development uh, together together as a church and individually. Just a few announcements and then I'll have Kevin open up our service. Uh, obviously you have some announcements in your bulletin, I'm not going to read all those, but just so you're aware, next Sunday Rick Leonard will be leading worship. On March the 20th, uh, Reverend Steve Disher will be here and he will be installing the new uh, consistory members. Herbert informed me that after that, he's open to the highest bidder. Is that right? <laughs> so if any of you want to, he's open up for bids. Just uh, but the, excuse me, the elders will be meeting tomorrow night to look at some of those type of things. Just for your calendar, also on Palm Sunday, which is April the 10th, the choir will be performing their cantata. So I know you want to be here for that. And of course, Easter is on the 17th of April and plans are now for us to have our traditional type Easter with the sunrise service, the breakfast, and, and worship following at that time. So uh, one other thing about Sundays, next Sunday uh, it's going to be earlier. Leap forward, okay? So leap forward next Sunday. We all jump ahead next, next Sunday. Um, and just one other reminder, uh, two reminders, the chili cook off see Christy if you have questions. And also the women's study is going on on Thursday. Ladies, if you have not participated in that, I'm sure it's not one of those things that you can't jump in. So if you have questions, please call Suzanne in the office and she'll make all the arrangements you need to, uh, to find a class to fit into and also to get the materials. And one final thing, those keys are still here. So I don't know how you're driving your vehicle, but it's still here. Kevin? Yeah, I think they found them on the steps back in the, uh, on the balcony. So, and it says on there, uh, drive safe, handsome uh, husband, love your lovely wife. So, <laughs> somebody, somewhere, uh, some wife is giving the husband a hard time about raising his keys, I'm sure, especially with that lovely saying. So, welcome, welcome all the members, guests that are here this morning on this lovely spring. And now it's not spring yet, but it feels like spring. Uh, so we're glad you're all here. Everybody that's worshiping with us online, we're so glad you're with us as well. Let's all stand together and sing our opening hymn today.
As we are gathered here today, as we begin Lent, appreciate Herbert, Trey, and Martha, and Shirley for uh, decorating a cross for as we go through this time. And as we join together in saying the Apostles' Creed, may uh, that be a visual reminder of the great gift and sacrifice of Christ. Let us begin. I believe in God, the Father, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome all of you in the Amen Corner. Of course, the people that are online and all of you here today. Uh, if there's a time that uh, we are in need of prayer, and this world's in need of prayer, I believe we are in the midst of that. And I know in your hearts there are people that you have uh, particularly on your mind and causes that you have on your mind. But before we go to some silent time individually, let me just share with you Shirley Frank. Please keep her in your prayer. She's going through uh, some health issues and emotional issues and mental issues, all those things with you with an amputation. Of course, we can understand that. So please, uh, please keep Shirley high on your list at this point. She's in need of our prayers. So let's go uh, quietly, individually, and then I'll uh, bring us into corporate prayer. Please bow our heads. Father, you know our inner selves better than we know it ourselves. But as we enter this Lenten season, may we grow in faith. Will you inspire us to grow as we appreciate the gift of your Son? Let us be a people that seek your way and your will. Let us be what you charge us to be. That's a light into a world that is very dark. And Father, we know that the world is struggling now. It has always struggled. But now when uh, you're absent in the hearts of many who are leaders, we ask that some way your will find peace and guidance. The solution is not us, Father. The solution is our hearts opening to you. And our petition and our prayer is very simple. Let us find our way through your Son. We celebrate the gift of Lent and the wonderful gift of Easter. Well, Father, it's beyond our ability to fully comprehend that. Let us just humbly come to you at this point in time and say, thank you for your grace and for your love. Amen. Good morning. Morning. Our scripture today is from Luke chapter 4, 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing those days, and at the end he was hungry. That he was. <laughs> 40 days. <laughs> the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you their authority and splendor. 
and it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. If you will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem, and he had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully, and they will lift up your, their hands so that they will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he had left him for an opportune time. Hearing of the reading of his word. Praise be to God. Let's continue our worship with our offering. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just thank you for blessing us so much. We live in such a messed up world, but here where we are in your presence, your holy presence, we have it all. And Lord, you've given us so much. May we always just remember how wonderful and how great and how gracious you are to us all. In Jesus' holy, holy, holy name, amen.
away from the words themselves, but when you uh, focus in on God above all, we're limited so much in uh, our own perspective that we're confined to the time and space in which we live, and uh, God is not. Thank be for that. The last few Sundays I was spending time uh, looking at a parable that is very well known, Particle Son, the passage that John read today. There's also a passage of scripture that I think is very familiar with. But the Gospels are full of wonderful accounts of Christ's life. And the story of him in the wilderness, I believe, is one of the most significant. Luke builds to this important account by informing us of other significant events in Christ's life. In chapters 1 and 2, we have Luke's beautiful account of his birth. And then we have Christ in the temple at the age of 12. And in a very unique and inspiring way, Christ fully recognizes and accepts that God is his true father. In chapter 3, he brings us and introduces us to John the Baptist. And when Christ is baptized... The hour has arrived, and then God approves the beginning of Christ's ministry here on this earth. And then in chapter 4, Luke gives us this wilderness account, which prepares Christ for his earthly mission. This account is very important, in my opinion, because it shows Christ rejecting the ways of the world to accomplish his God-sent mission. It is through this wilderness experience that Christ understands and accepts that his mission will be accomplished not by his supernatural powers, but through his personal suffering, crucifixion, and resurrection. So as we begin, two general points I'd like to present. This is a most powerful and sacred story, as it could only have been known by Christ telling it to his disciples. At some moment in their time together, he shared this most intimate experience so that we would better appreciate him and his mission. We must also understand that only a person who could do astonishing supernatural things would have been challenged in these ways. There is no temptation for us to turn stone into bread or to take a leap off the top of a temple because we know that would simply be foolish. These temptations would only apply to someone who had special power and a need to understand them to fulfill his mission. This account also dramatically informs us that this tempter, the devil, knew the person and the power that he was fighting. While these temptations would only have application to Christ and his mission, they do provide us insight 
into our own human failings. There are three elements in this powerful story. Christ first withdrew from the world and all of its distractions, and then he fasted. While there, he reflects on the best way to fulfill his mission, and finally, he overcomes temptations presented by the ruler of the flesh. At the beginning of Lent, we spend time and energy on the idea of fasting and may not give the two other elements of this story their proper attention. Christ was alone in the wilderness, reflecting on the mission that he was about to undertake. Thankfully, he refused to be swayed from his purpose and it is important for us to appreciate this story as we begin our journey through Lent. Christ's mission beginning in the wilderness may seem odd, but when you look at it, the world through a spiritual eye, that is where we live. He experienced what we know as we often feel alone in a world that is wild, harsh, and uncaring. We live in a wilderness. The actual wilderness of Christ's experience is known by the translated name of devastation. It sits 1,200 feet above the Dead Sea, is dry and full of jagged rocks and stones. This desolate wilderness is where Christ went to prepare for his mission, while most of us would vote for a beach with a pool so we could relax and be catered to as we focused on this new mission. When we look at this account from Luke, we must guard against thinking that these three temptations came about like scenes in a play. Christ went to this desolate place for 40 days to wrestle with the problem and seek the solution of how best to save mankind. Please note that when Luke concludes this wilderness account, he tells us, and as John read, that the tempter did not stop, but only withdrew until another time. For us, it is important to realize that opportune times to drift in our faith due to temptation come daily, routinely, and all too often. We need the lessons of the wilderness. During Lent, we are asked to spend time in reflection, examination, and repentance as we seek spiritual growth. This cannot be accomplished by the use of a familiar thought or saying, I've got half a mind. We know this expression well as we too often live with a half a mind attitude to do this or to do that. Half a mind is an inclination but not a decision, a thought, but not an action. It implies that you have half a mind to completely ignore something because it's an annoyance that just keeps nagging away. As hunger and temptation were experienced by Christ in the wilderness story, I think he addressed this important question while alone he answers an everlasting question that has implications for us. He asks this question, will this decision bring me nearer to God or take me further away? Knowing ourselves, our gifts, our talents, and our weaknesses help us be aware of our spiritual standing. The idea of giving something up for the Lord is a declaration that it is time to give our spiritual weakness a hard time as we resist and overcome that which takes us from God. Christ never did anything with half a mind. A half-hearted or half-minded believer becomes the devil's playground. Christ teaches us to meet the challenges and temptations of our wilderness, wilderness world with his word, to be confident in our relationship with God while being certain of the presence of the spirit that is with us always. 
Christ's first temptation was to turn stones into bread. As stated earlier, this wilderness was not one of sand, but instead full of, full of small limestone rocks that resembled loaves of bread. The tempter is presenting to Christ this common human reality. If you want people to follow you, use your power to give them the material things, the things that bring them pleasure, and then they will blindly follow. The devil was telling and tempting Christ with a very much human truth. You can get people to like and follow you by bribing them with things that they need, that they want, or desire. Christ responds by quoting from Deuteronomy 8, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness those 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart? Whether or not you would keep his commands, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. This powerful response reminds us that while Christ consistently addressed the needs of the people he encountered, his real mission was to produce new people with lives centered on God. He knew that conditions in this world would only improve when people had changed hearts and lived with a godly focus. God's plan centers on believers becoming godly people with full hearts, not half minds, enacting God's will to remove the wilderness that is too common in all of our lives. We are charged to be full-hearted and full-minded believers. In the second temptation, Christ sees the entire civilized world from a mountaintop. The, ten the temptation is simple. Worship me and all of this will be yours. In other words, compromise on your mission and look at all you can gain and gain it so quickly. The temptation of compromise. Something that we daily face with others, ourselves, our work, our families, and our faith. While the tempter had many people in his grasp, he was asking Christ not to set his standards so high. Just compromise a little with evil. Just a little with wrong. And then look at all that can be gained. Many of us have selected what looked like a good shortcut for desired gain and then, and often too late, realize the cost of compromising on that decision. Again, Christ responds to the tempter from Deuteronomy 6 with the following. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. His reply is supported again out of Deuteronomy 10 where we find, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widows, loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are not to love those who are you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast, hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. We are often and easily tempted to win something by compromising biblical standards as they just seem so demanding 
and so difficult in a world that constantly seeks comfort. However, our faith charge is to see the beauty of God's holiness and moral demands as goods and the damage that sin does in our lives. God does not compromise with sin. He is not half-minded about our spiritual lives and our eternal souls, and nor should we. And finally, the third temptation brings Christ to the top of, a temp top of the temple, a place where King Solomon himself may have stood. The temptation to jump from the roof of a high structure does not sound too attractive. But this temptation is powerful as it is centered upon the human desire to witness things and think about this for a second when you turn on the local news or anything. We are drawn to witness things that are sensational, magical, mysterious, astonishing, and memorable. We are easily entertained and attracted to the extraordinary and strange. Just go to the movies, turn on the TV, surf the net, watch YouTube, or visit Instagram and all the other social medias. It seems like when you give people sensations, they are fascinated and they want more thrills Today we have a new name for those people, we call them influencers. But again, Christ quotes Deuteronomy 6 with his response. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. If you recall your Old Testament stories, Massa is where the Israelites were angry with Moses over a lack of water. And then Moses struck a rock, which produced them ample water. It is also interesting to note that the word Massa, when it is translated, means testing or rebellion. Christ knew well that if his ministry was based upon sensationalism, his mission would become a wonder, a spectacle, and short-lived because sensationalism does not impact our hearts, only our eyes. He knew that spectacles excite the mind, make good conversation, but they do not move the spirit, and Christ knew all too well the danger of temporary attractions in our lives, and we do too. As we recall Christ's victory in the wilderness, we also know that his journey eventually leads to that, the cross. But let us appreciate that this wilderness account is a message of comfort and demand. We can take comfort in knowing that Christ lived and experienced a personal Lent through these unique temptations. And then he began his mission for our salvation. His fasting and victory in the wilderness shows us that endurance is required to overcome temptation and hardship. While we can confidently carry out our faith because Christ left us the spirit for guidance and support. Christ is teaching us to be in faithful obedience while trusting in his word and promises by surrendering and humbly coming, coming to Christ. We find purpose and we find meaning despite the allure of our own wilderness world temptations. Christ is showing us that we can come out of this wilderness and find true life and true meaning through a relationship with God. As we are gathered here today on this first Sunday of Lent, 
our eyes and our hearts are directed toward Easter. During this church season, let us remember that Easter is a gift, not a reward. Easter will come not because we perform perfectly during Lent, because we will lapse, become half-minded, and perhaps embarrassingly fall to pleasures and forget our desire to be devoted believers. Thankfully, we have the faithfulness of Christ in this wilderness. There the best went has been performed with total obedience and selflessness by the only person who never needed Lent. Lent is a gift opportunity of spiritual growth, but Easter is the ultimate gift. And note this simple truth before we dismiss today. Easter is closer now than when we began today's worship. Be at peace and seek Christ through this wilderness that too often accomplishes too much and accompanies us too often in this world. The perfect Lent of Christ makes Lent a time of invitation, self-examination, and a reason for joy. Let us celebrate God's love and Christ's faithfulness because it was his faithfulness to his mission that resulted in Easter. And the grace that followed was and remains simply amazing. Let us celebrate Lent and Christ coming out of the wilderness because he showed to us the promises of God's kingdom. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing our closing hymn, number 202, Amazing Grace. <laughs>
In the wilderness, Christ experienced the physical, mental, and emotional wilderness that we sometimes experience in our own lives, too often experience, because life indeed is difficult. Not a negative statement there, a reality. But within that, Christ came out of the wilderness showing us the hope, the grace, and the love that is available to those who wish to seek his way and his will. May we be that not only during Lent, but as a goal for our lives, spiritually, emotionally, as we reach those around us. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you this time you have given us together. May we uh, be that people that in the darkness that is around us, instead of dwelling upon it, complaining about it, and fussing about it, may we be a people that looks to you for the peace and the joy that comes through the endurance and the faith that you have a way and a will, and it is, us to us, it is up to us to seek it, to find it, and then to follow it. Let us be that people that you wish us to be. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a good week, folks.